Welcome to another episode of the Peak Potential Success Show. My name is Fong Chua. I'm an entrepreneur, business strategist, real estate investor, speaker, and also best-selling author. And every single day, I help others unlock potentials and guide them to succeed. Today on the show, we have another great guest. I've noticed her a lot on social media, posting great, engaging content. But I also notice her a lot at networking events and uh, different business conferences. And every time she speaks, people listen because she's so good at what she does. And she adds so much great value. And it's always, always nice to hear her speak and ask questions or add input. Uh, so so much great insight and the reason why i think she's so good at so many different things is because she loves turning those up op- those those uh, challenges into opportunities helping people to get debt free to live free helping people to build produce different companies and businesses and grow them helping people grow into leadership roles and become more and more successful so how does one become so great in so many different things? Here's here's a quick little list. She's good at sales. She's good at business. She's good at branding. She's good at corporate finances. She's a corporate lawyer, a music lawyer. And the list goes on and on. And for lots of people, they go, how do you get so good at so many different things? I mean, I could be an expert in one or two things, but wow, that list is absolutely incredible. And I'm sure she's going to share some of her secrets today. Uh, so I'm very, very excited to have her here. So please welcome entrepreneur, uh, corporate lawyer, agency owner, real estate investor, speaker, coach, entrepreneur, all that great stuff, uh, CEO of Debt-Free Lifestyle and Chunk Financial Group, Ms. Linda Chung. Thank you. Thank you, Fawn. <laughs> wow. I was just like, but thank you so much for the intro. Very, very, uh, very uh, kind. <laughs> well, it's awesome having you here. I've always wanted to chat with you and I'm very, very excited. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your time, for being here. Uh, Next first question right off the bat is, give me your origin story. How did you become the person you are today who's so well-versed in so many different things? You know, I, I've been saying this a lot lately. I, I was like, well, you know, I think I um, I joke, but it's kind of true and kind of not true. But I say I joked in, that I peaked in fourth grade because I was like a mini Renaissance woman at a young age. Um Partly because I think, you know, you've heard the phrase maybe um, tiger mom, right? Yep. Um, I think uh, Mama Chung, as she's known by many people uh, in my life, she was more like a dragon mom. <laughs> so she was kind of like a tiger mom on steroids, I'd say. So uh, I don't know. Uh, my upbringing is, is, I would say, very traditional Asian American upbringing. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, my, my upbringing and parents were from South Korea. So, um, I joke that they had to keep, keep up with the Kim Park and Lee, you know, so those are the <laughs> most common, you know, Korean names. And so it was like, okay, well, what are they doing? You know, oh, so-and-so is, you know, studying, uh, uh, learning violin. Um, they're also doing, you know, tennis. They're also volunteering at the hospital and all these things. So it was just kind of just early on. I, I did so many things as um, a child, really. I mean, if I actually did and kept up with everything, I, I would be, the list would be a lot longer than what you were saying now. Um, <laughs> I started doing ballet, uh, oil painting, tennis, skiing, golf. Um, and then I took it you know, upon myself. That wasn't enough. And I tried new things um, when I was older and could pick my own things, um, you know, and then I thought I want to learn lacrosse in college, you know, and just take up or, or sailing. Lots of things that I'm interested in. Um, but also I realized not everything that I had the, I guess, the passion or the, you know, practice to continue to do that. Um, certain things I continue to do. I, I actually just played golf you know, the other day with some work colleagues. Uh, and I hadn't played literally in a round of 18 in at least five years, I would say. But I learned, I said I peaked because I, uh, in fourth grade, I was a nine hole champion. Uh, <laughs> and I pretty much, I thought I probably played about the same level because I hadn't really practiced since then, really. You know, I kind of just, you know, did it for because it was a thing to do. And I think that those young impressions and what you surround yourself with and the type of people. Um, so I was always, I guess, one open to learning new things. Um, and just having, I guess, the privilege of being able to participate and try new things and not everything would stick, but, um, the things that I really liked and enjoyed, um, how do I become better at anything? A lot of it is just, you know, as the joke goes, the Carnegie Hall, it's like, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Right. Practice, practice, practice. 
So same thing, you know, it's like what applies to any skill, whether it's sales, whether it's musical instruments, sports, and in that sense, it's really not a secret to success. It, you know, part of it is just real good old fashioned hard work. You know, there's no shortcut. Um, and the other, I think you can accelerate that. You can then, you know, of course, the minimum stakes is hard work, but then you can work smarter. And that's where um, having mentors, like people who have walked the walk or who have achieved what you want to achieve. And you can, you know, as the phrase goes, you can, a smart person learns from their own mistakes, a genius learns from others. And if you have someone that you can, um, you know, basically follow the leader and, you know, whether it's being healthy, losing weight or being successful in business, if they've um, broken a path to do that and achieve that, and you, you start to act, think and feel and do the things that people before you have done, uh, that's, that's really, you know, I think a quicker way to do it. And then you can actually accelerate. You do it in one area, you can do it in other areas. So that's so, kind of, it's a process, really. So how did you end up uh, zeroing in as being a lawyer? It's kind of a default almost story. You know, it's not so exciting. Um, it's not that I necessarily really grew up saying, okay, you know, like some people that like always knew from a young age, not really for me. The closest thing I actually thought when I was younger, um, this is probably um, a direct correlation of what um, is because just of all the TV shows you watch, uh -huh. you see, um, it would be like, oh, I thought that was a totally natural course of career choice. You know, I had no idea. Um, and I think I just love to solve mysteries and solve problems. And that kind of what was, you know, and there were always kind of people problems, really. You know, someone did something bad and trying to solve it. And um, that's what you know, I think I was naturally attracted to. And then, you know, part of it was really the only aspect of law that really ultimately when I found out more about what it was, um, <laughs> was really being a judge. Um, I had no interest really in being a lawyer, you know, fighting for people's rights, really. You know, I didn't, uh, that didn't, you know, I would say the one exception is consumer rights. Anything like that, for some reason, I'm very passionate about that. I bring out, you know, they kind of like help my clients. And if they have some issues and, you know, the bank or whoever they're dealing with is giving them um, an issue and, and they're entitled to know or something, I'm like, I have no problem getting on the phone with them, escalating it up to, you know, supervisor, so forth. I, I have no qualms of that. That particular area I'm very, very passionate about. Um, and I think maybe because I'm a middle child, I don't know, but I just loved, um, the idea of, you know, kind of mediating and problem solving people problems, because a lot of the world's problems, if you look at it, they're ultimately people problems, you know, agree, we often can't agree to disagree anymore. And it's, I don't know, times have changed or something where any slight differences in people, people focus on those differences and make it about, you know, trying to totally destroy the other person just because they think differently, look differently. And there's, I, I, you know, probably could get canceled for just saying this, but I mean, there's no like politically correctness assumes like there is a right and a wrong answer. And that's why people fight, you know, so to the death, you know, and I don't think that's healthy. It's just really more like everyone is right exactly down to their own assumptions, their own experiences that have led them to think these, these ways, like, you know, some people like red, some people like blue. It's not one is necessarily better than the other. They're just different. And, um, you know, if we can just kind of remember that, I think, then um, we can just agree to disagree and just find like a neutral way that um, to to kind of see that their, their opinions, feelings, all of those are unique and subjective. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I was just listening to a book, um, I, I I was just listening to an audio book. I think uh, Jay Shetty, you know, he's the guy that was like a monk before and he, he just released a new book, um, like the eight rules of love. 
and uh, he was talking about, you know, there's the phrase that, you know, there's the, um, in each circumstance, I says, there's three, three opinions. There's the um, one, you know, there's say my opinion, your opinion, and then, and then there's the, the truth, you know, somewhere in between. So we can't like ignore that. Um, and we can't, uh, you know, it, it's just, I think that's where, and we all, I mean, we feel like individually our truth, it's almost like I have some issues with people saying my truth, you know, and your truth, there's the, there is an objective reality of what happened, but it will always be filtered by my experience of it because I can only see my, from everything from my perspective, my beliefs, my experiences, so forth, and you with your experiences and so forth. And while we 100% believe that we are seeing the truth, it's not objective. Can't be, just human nature. Um, there's another woman, I, I can't remember her name, but uh, she uses the analogy of a beach ball. I think her last name is Scott. I like to read a lot and kind of, these are other types of mentors to kind of shortcut, you know? So she published a, a book called Fierce Conversations. She said, there's reality, picture it like a beach ball right? And you're looking at the beach ball and there are say four people standing around the beach ball, right? Um, and from my perspective, I see red. From your perspective on the other side, you see blue. One person sees yellow, the other per person sees orange. We're all objectively telling the truth, what we see, but none of us can see from the other person's perspective or the whole reality all at the same time. You know, the right. same thing that happens, you know, I think in life. So, um, you know, that's kind of the philosophical, I guess, journey. But then there's the practical reality of um, I really thought, you know, I also wanted to be many different things growing up. I wanted to be, I said, when I realized a pri private detective wasn't really kind of a common, as common and kind of potentially dangerous, I didn't really pursue that. Um, and then I wanted to be an architect because I was a weird young kid. And instead of drawing, you know, drawings of, you know, people or whatever, I drew floor plans, okay, <laughs> like you see in a magazine, Architectural Design digest. I was just like, I'm going to draw the floor plan of my ideal home, you know, multiple bedrooms, multiple levels, all these things, so I was kind of weird in that way, and then I wanted to, you know, become an architect, and then I remember distinctly my mom, Mama Chung, saying, do you know, you know, like I am pay or something. I saw him and I was like, oh, you know, I want to be like that. She's like, that's like one in a million. That's like the odds are you be a successful architect is like one in a million. Don't do that. You know? So I was like, okay, well then I am dating myself, but I, I also was like looked at Sorry, my Wi-Fi is very, very spotty. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, the other thing I looked at was a, a woman named Connie Chung. She yep. was, you know, a newscaster, and she was the first Asian person I ever saw on TV back then. So I was like, I want to be her. And then same thing. I was like, you know what? She, it's just like one in a million. There's Asian woman discrimination, et cetera. You're never going to be able to. One in a million. Don't do that. So I was like, okay. And then it was kind of like, multi, you see a pattern here, multiple like process of elimination. So, and then I thought it was going to be a pediatrician and go to Princeton. My dad was a doctor. He was an OBGYN. And he said, no, you know what? For you to become a doctor, by the time you finish all the schooling and everything, you'll be too old to get married. No one will want to marry you. So don't be a doctor. And I was like, okay. I didn't get into Princeton, so not be a doctor. And then I also realized personally, the sight of blood made me sick. So I was like, maybe that's not path for me and uh, instead I really wanted to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist you know helping people in that way and funny enough I think that that's really ultimately what I do most in sales you know mm -hmm. coaching mentoring people I'm just helping people um, for the most part just just get better or get out of their own way you know we mm -hmm. often don't know that you know that we're our biggest limitation mm -hmm. you know, so Something you mentioned that uh, when during that that period of time was it, everything's a people problem. Everything is dealing with people, being able to talk to them and whatnot. Um, and a lot of that is 
fueled by emotions. People are so 100%. involved with their thought process that they don't want to be wrong. And they they get so angry. They get so emotionally involved. So for somebody like you, who is, let's say, in the middle of it, trying to negotiate with somebody or help somebody out with their, their mindset and whatnot, how do you talk to them so that they can potentially see it a little bit differently? They, you can't change it completely, but you're no, able to no, kind of burst no. their mindset over. I think one of the things is you have to, there's, it's kind of like um, people have to be willing to be open. Like can't force anyone to change their thoughts or opinions or anything like that. And if they're hundred percent dead set in their ways, even, you know, it's difficult enough to even change ourselves, even when we want to, and even when we know it's a good thing, like being healthier. Right. So let alone trying to tell somebody else, you know, one telling doesn't work in general, I think, you know, like it just is not, most people don't like to be told, you know, how to think or what to do or something, right? Um, except in, in maybe unusual circumstances where they acknowledge that I have no clue. But most of the time, if it's a choice about our own life or things like that, then we're kind of like, I know it's my life, my my choices, so forth. Um, and what I find can be helpful is that at least if there's a, a even a 1% possibility that they're open to seeing another view, or um, then you can ask questions, you know, to understand. Because a lot of times it's not the surface level answer we say, you know, um, you know, there's like an exercise you can do. Be like, well, you know, say for example, someone that I'm trying to hire maybe or interview, you know, they say, I'm like, well, what are you looking for in your life? Like, what do you want? And they're like, oh, I want to make more money. Say, it's like, okay, well, why is that important to you? Mm-hmm. And you know, it's a pretty common answer, but the if you keep on digging down, right, and asking like, why is that important to you? The whys are very, very different, you know, across different people, you know, and you know they might say, well, I want to have more money, so I'm not so stressed, you know, about the bills, you know, that's one way, or they want more money because they want to be able to take a vacation. That's another, you know, feeling, right? Or it, or they want to really um, be able to, you know, take their family on this, you know, once in a lifetime trip or do something, you know, or start a nonprofit, you know, there's all these different why, you know, so that's what's most interesting to me. And when you understand why people think they way the way they do, then you can ultimately understand more about their beliefs and more about their assumptions under that. And then you can address those. That's kind of a sales process, you know, isolate what's the objection. And oftentimes, you know, when people are disagreeing, they really are fundamentally not even really um, that different. You know, they just have different assumptions mm-hmm. or they just have different beliefs, like, you know, um, yeah. even just a simple sale of something. And they're like, oh, they think it costs too much or something. And they don't realize that actually what they're not doing it, you know, would cost them way more. So it's just like a different assumption reframing that. So it's it's kind of really understanding more about people's beliefs and more about values. Because ultimately, I think if you really dig deep and go deep enough, we have many, many, more often than not, we have more similar values and things. You know, everyone wants to have more, you know, more safety, more freedom, more options, um, be able to have less stress, you know, less, uh, more health, you know, like it's kind of universal, those things. Mm, right. So I think if we were all focused on ultimately how we're all part of the human team, I think then um, we can all learn to how to work together better. Mm. Very, very true. Well said. Um, you talked about how it's one thing to tell people how to uh, advise people what they should or should not do. It's another thing for yourself to convince yourself that, hey, I need to do this. But sometimes you're like, ah, I don't really want to, or I know this is something I should do, but it's tough and whatnot. How do you train your own mind to be able to overcome uh, certain challenges yeah. or certain adversities that you place in yourself? Yeah. You know, p- p- large part of it is 
you have to have the self-awareness or the experience of different things will motivate different people. And you have to do the work to understand what motivates yourself. You know, honestly, for me, money does not motivate me. You know, it, it's just like if money was the main motivation, I probably would have stay, stayed being a corporate lawyer. because I would have made good six, seven figures and it would be all about the money. And that's the more conservative path. But that wasn't the top priority for me. You know, and it was just like, really, what does it money do for my life? And, and um, you know, thinking about this and, and what's the most important for me at this time in my life, you know, and then different things and that can evolve and change. You know, so there was a certain period of time where my family had a lot of health challenges, you know, and um, really money was not the top focus. Um, you know, I made good money when I was a lawyer, so I'd go to Mount, you know, save and invest it and so forth. And, and really having the flexibility was the most important thing, mm -hmm. you know, and having that. And when you, especially when you don't have the flexibility, you really appreciate when you can. You know, I work when I was working as a corporate lawyer, I was not enslaved, but it felt like it, you know what I mean? Like I was chained to my desk. I was sleeping, you know, at office sometimes working 60, 80, hundred hour week and really, you know, vacations canceled, plans canceled, um, really living in fear of the phone or email or what was coming through. Cause I had really, you know, just kind of, as soon as it came through, I had to start working on it. Right. And that was complete opposite of flexibility. So for me, it was really about um, having an understanding and being grateful for, you know, what I have in my life. Not to say that I'm not still working on achieving and doing more, you know, but, but you can be, I think, simultaneously, I realized this, extremely grateful for everything that you have in your life. Uh, also, at the same time, being very motivated to achieve more. Mm -hmm. And it takes, I think, doing both of those. So that um, I know that what motivates me is really have a vision, a very clear vision of what I'm working towards, you know, in the future, like the big, way bigger picture. And then what I know, that's the what, you know, and the why of it is also very um, important to understand. Mm -hmm. um, and really like why I want to do it. Like, you know, one of my goals is, is really to create another like separate company that is really focused on um, helping people do this through education, through learning. The emotions are really the, the, what's always underrunning, I think, every decision. You know, you can use facts and logic to support it, but ultimately you feel good about using facts and logic. So it's ultimately a feeling. <laughs> so um and creating that vision of the future you know and being able to help people because so much of what we do realize it's a human thing it's a human problem thing and it's really because one of the things that we least understand um it, because we never taught it in traditional school never taught it in definitely not law school definitely not business school um is really how our emotions work and how the thoughts and the, and the emotions and the physical body all are interrelated and you know really understanding that on a kind of really super deep level I think can really help transform so much of the people's issues and problems that we have inside out you know not outside in right. so that's what really having that clarity and then understanding okay I can kind of have the plan roughly worked out it's not going to be like that it's going to be executed according exactly the plan because no no plan ever is because we can't predict the future and all those kind of things but at least the directional path forward that i can see that and to me i'm super excited about that you know so it's just like i used to have a problem snoozing you know because it's like if, if snoozing it's like oh you know i'd rather sleep or what i'm dreaming about is better than my actual life that's an issue. That's a problem, right? Versus getting up and being like excited, you know, for my life, you know, for those things. Like it's going to be a great day. You know, even today, you know, I woke up before my alarm, like an hour before my alarm. So it's like, okay, today I'm going to be doing this and, you know, have podcasts with Fong and you know, meetings with all these other people, uh, you know, excited and going to see friends as well and work along the way. So, and I feel so grateful and fortunate to be able to have that, you know, like it's great life. Awesome. I can imagine that you wake up going like, I'm ready. I'm ready every single day. <laughs>
<laughs> not every single day, but yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, um, it's it's a, it's a winning. I think um, you know, I, I did this practice. I under you know, I I do a lot of reading and understanding from a lot of different things like stoicism. You know, and it's just like there. I did this practice um, where one of them is like you plan your ideal day. You know, and it's like, huh, you know, just like proactively plan what would your ideal day look like, you know, and I've done that for a while now. And usually it's around New Year's, you know, it's just kind of reset. And, and each year it gets a little some new things, but also, you know, the, the it's it's interesting because across I did this with, you know, with like a, a group of global entrepreneurs from around the world. And it's funny, it's not that the ideal day is hardly ever like this big grandiose day. Right. You know, the ideal day is often like, you know, these kind of your typical day that, you know, you're being your ideal self, like getting up early, getting a good workout in, eating healthy, um, doing some work, being productive, spending time with friends and family, you know, watching something that, you know, learning something that feeds my mind maybe watching something, you know, a movie that's really inspiring or entertaining, you know, and getting good rest and so forth. You know, it, it, and across the world, it was very, very similar. It wasn't these big, huge things. So if you do that, you know, you create your ideal day. And I would do that starting off as like Sunday as my ideal day, right? And then if you just do more and more of living your ideal day, make sure you do it once a week at least. And then it's just like, oh, why limit it to just one day, you know? And then the more and more ideal days you have, right? Mm -hmm. Then the more and more of an ideal life you have, right? You know? So I just think, um, you know, and, and sometimes you wake up, you know, maybe I didn't get a good sleep, you know? And it's just like, or maybe I had a lot of stuff on my mind and it's just like looping while I'm sleeping. So, you know, in those days, it's just kind of like, okay. And then it's just a good reminder of, okay, you know, what am I, why am I getting up? Why, what do I, what, there's something that I can be excited about in my life, you know? And, you know, when I'm coaching people, I ask them a couple of questions, like, no matter what the experience is, because kind of like, if you make your life really and your happiness dependent on results, that can be a very up and down life. You know, because so much of our life is not within the reality is not within our control. You know, it's dependent on other people making their decisions. And they say, no, I'm not going to buy this, you know, and instead um, making it about what you can control, which I think is your mindset, your emotions, your activity and feel good along that process of like I did what I could do. And, you know, the results will come as an effect of me being consistent with that. And I can, you know, always be proud of something, I think, any experience. Um, I can always be, always learn from every experience, you know, whether it's good or bad result. And I think there's also always something I can improve from an experience. So all those things and, and also something in the future be excited about, you know, looking forward to, you know, making a change in the future. So just keep on doing that self-evaluation, I think, then um, the, the more proactive and kind of adopting that, I think, process, then the more, more the results will come as an effect of just constantly getting better. Right? Um, you, you talked about how you read a lot, and that probably is the reason why you're so good at so many different things, because you read so much into all those things. Um, it also allows you to be able to relate to so many different people, because from different experiences, different knowledge and all that kind of stuff, you can kind of pick and choose what you want to share and have conversations with those people on. Now, lots of people say, oh, I, I need to read more. Oh, I really want to read more. But one of the reasons why they don't is they don't retain the information that they read. So mm -hmm. what's your yep. secret? How do you read so much and retain so much of that information that you read? You know, I think I, I wasn't, I would, I'll be honest. I, I don't think I retain much like most people. If I looked back, like a lot of the books that I'm reading now, like one of them again is atomic habits. And, um, and one of the books, it, hold on a second. One of the books is atomic habits. And I actually read that several years ago, right when it came out. Um, and I don't think I retained much of it, 
you know, it was as if uh, I was reading it again for the first time. You know, I clearly had made some notes because I was reading the paperback and I had, you know, notes and stars. And I was like, okay, I clearly, that's my handwriting. I did read this and make a note of it. But, and I think a lot of it, and I love to learn, but, and I always say like, you know, they say the phrase is knowledge is power. I, I don't quite agree with that. I think it's knowledge is potential power. Mm -hmm. Meaning like if you, but if you don't take action on it, then it doesn't actually become part of your life, really, because then it just lives in the your thoughts and it doesn't actually see any effect in the real world. Um, and so now I, I think I used to read for efficiency and just kind of say, check the box, but not for effectiveness. And so now it's a practice where I try to read um, everything that I'm, you know, really want to develop three times. First time I just kind of read just to kind of get the I idea and just kind of just quickly through just so I understand, you know, is this really kind of the, the whole scope of what's in here? And then the second time I read more for just making notes and highlights and things like that and things that stand out. And then the third time, it's really kind of almost with paper next to it and actually taking action, you know, from it and then implementing like just even from 10 pages. You know, some pages have more action oriented things than others. And if I can just take one action, one little step, you know, I don't have to do the whole thing, but just kind of, you know, it might be I don't know, one action. It was uh what was one recent thing? I, I, can't, I can't even remember. But, you know, it's just like one, it's, it, the, the, the good news and the bad news is that, you know, when I write it down, then I know it and I have it. And then I put it in an action item and then I put it in my calendar and I'll implement it. But then also in same, same respect, if I don't have my written thing, then I'm like, okay, I don't know. Because it's like written down and I don't take, take up my memory now, you know. Um, but but really, that's the key. And, you know, as JT, you know, JT Fox, as he always said, speed of implementation. That is right. so key, you know, because if you don't do it, out of sight, out of mind tends to be. So so do you because you're you're involved with so many different things like you're, you're reading a lot, you you have different companies, you have business, different roles. Do you segment your days for saying, okay, this portion of time is dedicated only to this and then, uh, or this day of the week is only dedicated to this kind of thing. Do you have that all systemized kind of thing? Yeah, I, I, I do. And, and really according to my calendar and, and, you know, as, as GT says, and I, I believe, you know, one of the more recent books I also read is power full of engagement. And it, it really highlights this where it's not really time management. It's really energy management. Mm -hmm. And the things that require more of my energy um, and different kind of energies, really. Like there's different things that are focused um, uh, time that I need real quiet solitude, um, you know, be in my office and no distractions. Um, that kind of stuff that it's either requiring um, something that I need to really uh, either do something new for the first time, creatively, writing, things like that, just getting it out of my head uh, uh, that I usually do in the morning you know after I do kind of my morning exercise routine and so forth um, and there and also what I find personally for me is that you know and each person's different this is kind of the key you know is really to know thyself um, that certain administrative things uh, attention to detail things like that I like numbers, but I don't necessarily like all numbers. You know, like I like gold numbers. I like looking at sales and things like that because um, it's more, you know, future oriented or just kind of achievement oriented. But, you know, things like um, looking at expenses, you know, and things like that, you know, I'm just like reviewing budgets. Ugh, I don't like that at all. You know, so it's just like, you know, like most entrepreneurs just like, oh, I'm just focused on growing the revenue and not looking about, you know, costs and budget and things like that or looking at the P&L. So I know that that for me takes a certain more discipline for me because it's not my natural, not something I like, not something I, you know, built the habits of doing on a consistent basis. So I know I, know I need to do that in time where I have more energy. 
So it has to be in the morning as well. Um, and also that oftentimes will have to be on a Sunday, like kind of my off day so that I don't have my usual distractions, not a distraction, but usual meetings and things like that, that take a different type of energy. Um, I can pretty much now, cause I've done it so much, you know, I, I say I can do things like freestyle, you know, not have to think about it if it's thinking, talking or whatever, being interviewed, speaking in front of group. I can do that. I've done it a lot. So I can, you know, kind of think of ideas pretty quick, quickly. Um, you know, and so that one, I don't, uh, I schedule that more tends to be more in the afternoon when I'm done with all the stuff that I need to do for myself. And then I can focus on helping others, coaching, mentoring, you know, leading, inspiring, all of that. So mm. that takes a different kind of energy, right. you know, so that's cool. So people need to uh, understand uh, what kind of energy is needed for a certain tasks that they do throughout their not lives so that they can segment it uh, correctly. Now, uh, you're an amazing yeah. leader. And there's a lot, there's that saying that says leaders are born. But you're a person who's really good at helping people grow into leadership. So explain mm -hmm. to us, or are there certain things that people can do who don't believe they're leaders? that they can do exercise-wise, task-wise, that would train them to become uh, more successful in leadership? I, there's this uh, phrase, I don't know if it's an Asian phrase or just a mama Chung phrase, you know, it's like <laughs> kind of the, the, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. It's mm -hmm. almost like there's a, there's a mentality in certain cultures as well. You know, Asians tend to be more group focused, um, as opposed to say Americans or, you know, English or Australians, but more individual focused. So a lot of the times that it's not because of, I think the person's born that way is culturally learned, I think a lot, you know, so it's like you either can get rewarded or punished for sticking out, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and really that's being a leader, you know, is really just by definition is the person who is, standing apart from others, you know, and some of that can be, it's like learn behavior and courage, you know, it's just like you get positive feedback or negative feedback. Um, and I think it's just giving people who may not have ever been thought of or given encouragement to be a leader, I think goes a long way, you know, and really, if you don't have the belief in yourself, which oftentimes people don't, you know, because most of the time, even it's, that's meaning, but almost, almost times, you know, like our closest, um, the people that can be hardest to, you know, um, to believe in you often can share the same last name, you know, so our close friends and family, because they, they, they want generally most of the time. And I think it's more, you know, what they're, which shows what's important to them. They want safety or security. You know, and that's kind of not doing things that's apart or different from the group or from the norm, you know, and it takes a certain either, I say, either a little bit crazy, courageous or contrarian person to go outside of that group mentality, you know, and so oftentimes it's just even just sharing with someone that you believe it's possible. They they are. And, and it's not that they're a leader, maybe entitled yet. You know, but it's true in showing them concrete examples of where they have exhibited leadership behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, when they did this, um, no one asked them to do this. They saw an opportunity. They 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 took action qu quickly um, and implemented it uh, right away. And not you know, it's kind of the entrepreneurial path, not waiting for permission. You know, and just kind of run with it. And they feel um, inspired to do it and to pro to recognize it and applaud that behavior, I think, mm -hmm. you know, and then it becomes a, a, what I call a virtuous cycle where they see like they, they get recognized for it feels good. I think everybody wants to be seen and recognized for, and often we don't do that enough. Mm -hmm. I think in right. being able to surround yourself with people who can notice these things, see the, not just the potential, because it almost like sounds like, well, you know, I don't think we're, we're all works in progress, you know. Um, and I think just see really show them how they are actually doing it now. And they might not know because it's hard to have those 
you know, um, her own perspective. Like we can't see what we, you know, is blind to us. So, and just being, it's easier to see in others. So I think that's a big part of it and nurturing that and, and rewarding that, I think. So, and then they just, it's just learned behavior. Right. Now you've worked with so many different people. You've been involved with so many different industries uh, and you've done well in so many different areas, which is there a, a story, a, a failure, a challenge or something that gave you the biggest lesson of your career so oh, far? Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I realized was I was working for a big um, consumer packaged goods company, you know, and I was doing brand management. And, you know, this is something that I realized that what was important to me and I was like, okay, something has got to change. I remember having those like, you know, kind of like wake up moments, like, okay, it wasn't really hitting rock bottom. It was more like just the realization, like I got to change or something's got to change. This is just not going to work. You know, like my life, like, or it's just sitting at the kitchen table. It was probably, you know, after I come back from work, but it was like 11 o'clock at night and I'm sitting there working at the kitchen table at 11 o'clock at night. And I was just like, this is, I'm not a corporate lawyer at this point. It's not part of the thing. There's something that I'm doing that is just not, this is not it. You know, I'm searching, I don't know. I had to do a lot of PowerPoint presentations in that um, career. And I spent a good half an hour, 45 minutes finding one image, you know, one picture to like capture a point. Mm -hmm. I was like, and I just was like, is this what my life is like? you know, like really like, and ultimately in the grand scheme of things, like, so I find this perfect image for this 50 page PowerPoint presentation, you know, and, and impress maybe, maybe, maybe not, you know, get a good job or, you know, whatever from a a VP and ultimately, you know, what does that translate to? You know, what difference does that make? You know, and knowing that, you know, especially within big companies, you know, and just the way the structure was, you know, I was leading a big global project. And for any one little decision, no less than 26 different people from all over the world that had to sign on to agree, mm-hmm. you know, and I was just like, is this what my life is about? Just to make one decision, <laughs> you know, just like the packaging or something, just the lettering or the font, you know, just something, you know, a small detail and important. Yes, but is that what, you know, I look back, you know, on my life and be like, yay, I, I, you know, launched this product, you know, the product launched and I see it on the shelves today and that makes me feel good. But, you know, that's not, if that's the only thing I have to show for my life, I I, I think I'd be, I'd be a little disappointed in myself, you know? So, um, Sorry, what was the question originally? No, I know. <laughs> a big life le- lesson, something that you've learned from it. and uh... Oh, yes. So from that, I realized like from that point, I was just like, okay. And I was like, just actually stop to think about what do I want for my life? You know, and, and, and versus reactively trying to make whatever I have now in my life work. Sure, I can make it work, but is that ideal? You know, is that really what I want to do? Like, maybe I could, you know, in the microcosm level, find the perfect image to find this perfect deck to do this and get a great job. You know, is that what my life is about? You know, versus, okay, zoom out, pause, think about, okay, what's the life that I want? What does that encompass? You know, and a large part of that is career and finances, because, you know, the reality is money makes more things be an option, you know, in your world. Um, and, um, so kind of reverse engineer, you know, what do I want in the world and what do I want to do and how do I want to do it? So that was kind of like my exercise of what do you want? Why do you want it? And then figuring out the how from, from that, you know? So when I realized I I didn't know exactly what I wanted, but I knew part of it was like, I, I knew I wanted to do something that actually helped people, you know, like made a difference in their life, like some, in some meaningful way, you know, not just pushing more product on them, you know, that they didn't necessarily need. Okay. Um, And, you know, um, why I wanted to do it. And I think for me, it's really about having that lasting impact on people. If they can 
as a result of, you know, something, inter some interaction with me, leave them, leave them in a little bit better place, you know, sharing with them something maybe that I learned that I thought was helpful. And then, you know, sharing that with them or leading them to a place where, you know, you can build your confidence, self-esteem, build your net worth, all of that, um, you know, then, you know, come with me. I'm, I'm going here. Anyone want to come with me? Um, so I wanted to help people do something more entrepreneurial where I didn't have to ask for permission to do X, Y, Z. I could just do it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and really the fun, the, and the last thing was where I could have both the time and financial freedom, you know, really, cause if I was just about financial, you know, honestly, right now you, you probably, you couldn't pay me enough to go back to my life as a lawyer where I didn't have that flexibility and freedom. You know, no dollar amount would be enough. Um, and really having the flexibility, really owning my life, really the choices that I make. And we all do. You know, it's just that I'm not willing to sacrifice um, my time and what's important to me and the flexibility now for any amount of any dollar amount. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the biggest thing. And then since then, that was maybe... That was October 2013. And by that time, I, I had was so realized, so not into my work at that point. And I knew I was either going to, it, it was either going to end with quitting or getting fired one way or the other. There was no way that come by the end of that year, I gave myself a deadline. I'm going to be out of this work, you know? So, and I just, one opportunity led to another, and I was just like, I went to a conference, randomly met somebody there who randomly introduced me to someone who um, had all these great trainings, and he learned how to be really more entrepreneurial and, and learn how to motivate, learn how to understand emotions and so forth. And, and I think that was part of, that was really the beginning of my um, really self-development. You know, I had a lot of formal education. I went to Dartmouth undergrad, Cornell Law School, Columbia Business School. All good for what they were, but they weren't really designed, I think, in general to help me live to my highest potential. <laughs> you know, so, and, and of course, it's, it's more of, that's a, you know, they have different purposes, you know, and it's just for, and my, one of the things that I realized was that I had to kind of change what, if I wanted my life to change, I needed to change. Mm -hmm. And so that was where I was very open and willing to just try something different and new and just open to um, a possibility of I didn't know what I, you know, didn't know. And I was just going to be open, like a very um, eager and thirst, thirsty student, you know, um, and really more of a you know, learning how to live a, a life that of your own choosing, you know, that you can design yourself. So since wow. then, that was, you know, that was a big pivot in my Who life. Who would have thought that one image would have changed your life? <laughs> can yeah. you imagine if you yeah. found that image yeah. right away, then this wouldn't have happened? I know. It's, 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 it's like, like you were on like page yeah, 10 of yeah. Google and you're Thank like, you. oh, I still can't find it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, it's a good thing you know those take those small blessings in disguise <laughs> so let's take you uh and put you back on the world stage and you have a few minutes to to give your legacy message to everybody to remember linda for what would be that message i would say um the biggest thing that you can do and the most impact that you can make in your life and in the lives of others is to believe in yourself and learn how to change yourself to become the person that you want to be. That's really the hardest work that we have to do now, I think, in life. You know, and um, if you want help with that, happy to talk about it, help, happy to help you in any way that I can. And uh, that's what I think is, it's really success and all that a, a, a rich life is an inside job <laughs> really a mental and emotional job nice that you learn how to that. execute 
<laughs> Nicely said, and I'm sure uh, lots of people should take that to heart. Um, before I let you go, I've got five very quick questions for you. Give me the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, number one, okay. you're stranded on a deserted island, and you have one food to eat for the rest of your life, no consequence. Oh, I mean, it used to be ice cream, hands down. Um, <laughs> but now, I think a little bit healthier, I would say banana. <laughs> so... Nice. No, no, no. I take it back. Eggs. Eggs. <laughs> Eggs are most versatile. I know. I'm like, you could do so many different things. Um, Hollywood calls and goes, Linda, mm -hmm. we love your story. Your journey is amazing. We want to do a story and a biopic on you. Who would you choose to cast as your best friend? As my best friend, okay. Um, I don't know why I said this. Jennifer Lawrence. I don't know. She just seems real. She seems <laughs> human. She fell in front of millions of people and could laugh about it, so... I think humor is such a key part. If you can laugh about it, not take to yourself too seriously, then, you know, life's fun. So. Great. So Jennifer Lawrence shows up at your door and goes, hey, I got the part. I'm excited. Let's get to know each other. Boy, I'm hungry. And you go, don't worry about this, uh, Jennifer. I'm going to go to the back. I'll fix you something amazing. What's that special dish that you can prepare? Yeah. Um, I would say it's like a, the Spanish omelet, the tortilla. Mm -hmm. With the pota sliced potatoes, onions, and tasty, it can be you know eaten all the time. And um, I don't know. I think when I was in college, I learned how to be a, a short line, whatever uh, cook. I, I made omelets basically. <laughs> I can make really, really good omelets. So awesome! Gonna have to try that sometime. Um, I'm gonna take you back to your lawyer days. Who is one cartoon character who you would like to go against in court? Huh. Cartoon character. So imagine a cartoon know, character reason, as right. a lawyer and you have to go against that lawyer who is a cartoon character. Who would that be? I, I, the first thing that comes up is Bugs Bunny. You know, he's a chameleon. <laughs> he can like dress in so many. He can be a man, a woman, funny, you know, this, I, I think it'd be really entertaining. You know, awesome. Dealing um, with the multiple personalities. Number from one to three. Three. One, two, three. So if you had to use binders as a metaphor for success, how is success like binders? Wait, can you repeat the question? How is success like binders? So binders as a metaphor for success. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, someone said this to me when I was a legal assistant. So in between uh, working and going to law school, um, they said the key to happiness as a lawyer is to be organized. So, you know, use a binder to be organized and just know, you know, know your business, know your numbers, know, know, know that. So it's, it's usually stress comes not from knowing something. Stress comes from not knowing something. So. I see that. So that's how success is like binders. Um, thank you very much for your time. Uh, this has been very, very enjoyable. Love the stories, loved all the uh, tips that you've given. Uh, what's the best way for people to reach out to you? Uh, I would say Instagram, Linda Chung Official is the best way. You can DM me there. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm usually the most responsive there. So Awesome. And do you have any uh, final words that you would like to share? Um, just, you know, thank you to you, Fong, uh, for reaching out and, um, you know, letting me be a part of your, um, what you've built here, your platform. I, I you know, really appreciate um you know, people connecting and, and giving me the opportunity to share um, if this hopefully helps, you know, some people in some small way that that's really what um, really motivates me and makes me, you know, very, very um, grateful for all the people in my life. So. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. Awesome. It was a, a pleasure having you on. Uh, it was a great time. Thank you very much for everybody. Make sure you connect with Linda. As you can see, she's uh, very, very uh, an expert in so many different areas, and uh, she could definitely help people out uh, if you just reach out. So thank you again. Uh, she is Linda. My name is Fong Chuan. Until next time, today is the day to lock your peak potential. We'll see you later.